Hi, Dara Hamilton at the Disability Rights Center. And today, the Disability Rights Center wants you to be healthy. And so we are going to talk about ways of preventing illness. As a psychologist, my primary focus is always uh, our mental health and our mental well-being. However, mental health and well-being and physical health and well-being, they go hand in hand, believe it or not. And so we're going to talk about creating lifestyles that lead to health. Um, I'm going to pull up a little presentation here to share with you, and we will be off and running with this. Okay, just click play. So let's look at some primary prevention of illness. And as I said, of course, as a psychologist, mental health is my primary concern, but there's no separating the parts of us. And so if I'm mentally not feeling well, then physically, chances are I'm going to have some physical symptoms as well. And if I have physical symptoms, chances are I'm not going to feel the best that I can feel psychologically or mentally. And I want you to hold one thing in mind. The idea of this presentation is that an ounce of, pre of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure. So we're really gonna be looking at what can we do to try to stay as healthy as we can and to prevent symptoms from occurring. This also speaks to the idea that it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. The idea that if we maintain a healthy lifestyle and maintain healthy behaviors, that we're, it's better to be able to do that than to have to put more efforts into trying to fix something once it starts to go wrong. So this is a great picture of, of us. I'm sure there are other elements that are involved, but the idea is as a person, there's my mind, my spirit, my heart, my body. Um, we can think of financial health, we can think of, of um, spiritual health and well-being, but all these components come together to make one healthy individual, one healthy person. Now, my area, mental health. Why does it matter? I believe that mental health is that which dictates all of our other behaviors. If we're feeling well mentally, then we're able to be more productive. We're able to actually reduce our, the likelihood of physical illness. We are able to earn more money when we are feeling mentally healthy. And we're able to have satisfying relationships when we feel that way. So our overall quality of life feels really, really good. Um, mental health matters. Now this guy is saying, I'm a little stressed right now. Just turn around and leave quietly so no one gets hurt. I don't want to be that guy. I think I want to be her. She's just really, really calm. And that's a great place to be. And let's see how we can use that ounce of prevention so that later on we don't need that pound of cure. This is based on the idea of the levels of prevention. Primary prevention is the idea that we want to prevent any symptoms from occurring at all. Secondary prevention has to do with, eh, maybe I'm developing some symptoms, a little sniffle, a little cough, maybe I'm starting to feel a little bit sad or anxious. And so now we have to do some intervention to try to bring me back up. But tertiary prevention is the idea that we're showing a lot of symptoms and now we have to put a lot of effort into not letting them get worse. And so we really want to focus on those areas of primary and secondary prevention because we want to stay as healthy as we can as we go through life. So let's look at some things that affect our mental health. The systems approach says that our biology, our psychology, and our social behavior and circumstances affect how we feel mentally. And actually, these components go into our physical health as well. Our biology is what we get from our, our parents and our grandparents and great grandparents and everybody who goes back to the beginning of time that gave us our genes and our genetics. And our biology can also be affected by things like stress. So let's look at that stress response. Stress is what happens when we are faced with an overwhelming task or something that really challenges us. It doesn't always have to be perceived as overwhelming. Sometimes we are faced with 
a wedding or something that seems really, really exciting to us. And still we end up getting stressed and believe it or not, we still have the same stress response. We have the increase in heart rate. We have the increase in breathing. We have a de decrease in digestive activity and our liver releases glucose for energy in this stress response. The stress response prepares us for action. It prepares us in case there is a bear or a saber-toothed tiger or a centipede like I saw last night, right? It increases our heart rate, breathing, it stops our digestion, it dilates our pupils, it gets us ready for action. And that's good because I really, really need to run if there's a bear coming. However, if I stay in this situation too long, it can really make wear and tear on my body and lead to physical illnesses like high blood pressure, like increasing risk for diabetes, increasing risk for stroke, and, and so forth. So the question is, can we affect our biology? What if my parents had heart disease or my parents have high blood pressure? What if diabetes runs in my family? What if depression runs in my family or anxiety disorders or other types of mental illness? How can I affect my biology? Well, believe it or not, we can affect our biology. You can do these at home. These are so simple sometimes. People feel like that's too simple, it can't work. But I'm going to tell you, the research is saying that these practices, exercise, yoga, meditation, breathing exercises, Tai Chi, Qi Jong, and guess what? Sleep, oops, I wanna put all those back up because they're so important. Um, and sleep all can affect our physical health as well as our mental health. And guess what? These exercises affect how our genes express themselves. That means that we may have certain genes because our family had certain illnesses. However, they don't have to express themselves. They don't have to manifest. I'm sure we have all known people who have grown up in families where everybody had high blood pressure or everybody had depression and this person doesn't. What might they be doing differently so that their genes don't express themselves in those ways? Maybe they're doing some of these exercises and the research is showing that they do help. So what about our psychology? Hmm. Our psychology has to do with the way we think about things and the way we perceive things and the things that we say to ourselves. And the research is finding that the way we think about things, the things that we say to ourselves, whether we give ourselves positive messages that motivate us and decrease our stress or negative messages that tear us down and increase our stress, or whether we're optimistic and we're able to look on the bright side of things or pessimistic and we're looking at the, the sad th side of things or the glass half empty kinds of things does affect how our body responds. We might say, oh, I know what's gonna happen. That's never gonna work. We may always have to be right. We may think I should do this and I should do that and I should have done the other thing. We may think, oh gosh, this one bad thing happened. That means my whole life is going wrong. That kind of thinking just adds stress and doesn't help us. So from now on, we're gonna be careful about how we talk to ourselves because we are listening. I'd rather talk to myself like this kitten than talk to myself in, these, in those negative ways for sure. I'd rather say I am worthy, I am loved, and I am enough than to say those bad things to myself, for sure. Social. So we have the biological, we have the psychological, and what about the social? The importance of social connections is becoming more and more obvious to us. People who have good social connections actually live longer lives, their immune systems function better, and they are at reduced risk for physical disorders, as well as mental disorders due to stress, anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. So 
Social connections are super important. Wanting to get social, you can volunteer, you can take a class or join a club, you can walk your dog down the street and run into other people walking their dogs, invite neighbors or colleagues for a drink or to the movie. You can track down old friends through social media and say, hey, let's catch up. Try carpooling to work, go to art galleries, museum shows, book readings, lectures, book clubs, start a book club. You can take a chance to become a social being and all of these benefits will be right there at your fingertips. So let's look at the idea of lifestyle diseases. Lifestyle diseases are associated with the way people or groups of people live. And so what this means is if we live a lifestyle that is healthy, we significantly reduce our risk of having or getting these diseases. In fact, this one study showed that health behavior explains about 40% of premature death as well as substantial morbidity and disability in the United States. Yes, about 40%. Our health behaviors, our exercise, our social behaviors, what we eat and drink, just how we generally live, those small details that we've talked about before explain about 40% of premature mortality in the United States. That is significant. By changing our lifestyles, we can affect our health. So let's do our part in staying healthy. You can search throughout the entire universe for someone who is more deserving of your love and affection than you are yourself. And that person is not anywhere to be found. You yourself, as much as anybody in the entire universe, deserve your love and your affection. So give it to yourself by being healthy, living a healthy lifestyle, and let's add some good stuff to your life like exercise, and focus on nutrition and diet, taking walks in nature, developing good relationships, using relaxation and stress management techniques, and religious and spiritual involvement. And remember to breathe.